Hey guys, welcome back. So, let's jump right into this video. Back in 1998-1999, Peter Brown, um, a historian and scholar I've mentioned before on this channel, and who most of you are probably at this point fairly familiar with, um, published this short little volume. It's about a hundred pages, give or take. It's called Late Antiquity. Not the world of Late Antiquity, that's a different book that he wrote way back in the 70s, but just Late Antiquity. Um, I've checked JSTOR, I've checked Project Muse, and a couple other sites, and it doesn't look like the stuff written in that volume is accessible on those sites. So most of you watching this probably will not have access to it, unless you torrent it or pirate it or something. However, I have access to it. So what I want to do in this video, and then probably two or three more, is take you through each of the four or five different essays that he wrote in that volume. So this one, we're going to be going through his article um, titled The Well-Born Few. It's about the late Roman aristocracy. And to get started, Brown says the following on page one. In order to measure the nature and extent of the transformation that began with the civic man of the age of the Antonines and ended with the good Christian member of the Catholic Church of the Western Middle Ages, the theme must be allowed to wander like a winding river throughout the length and breadth of Roman Mediterranean society. It washes past many banks, touching on issues as intimate and as private in the modern sense as the changing meaning of marriage, of sexuality, and of nudity. Yet during these centuries, the river was fed by a concern largely alien to modern persons. Whether it be in the life of the notables of an Antonian city or in the habits of a late Roman Christian, we meet at every turn an ancient sense of the need for public community. For a community in which the experiences of the private individual were permeated at every level by the values of the community and were frequently expected, in ideal conditions, to be totally transparent to these public values. The way men and women in specific social contexts in the Roman world guided their lives in the light of changing notions of public community to which they sensed they belonged provides insight into the history of the private life of Western Europeans. Okay, so between... I mean, I know on the screen here I have about 250 and about 600. That's, you know, approximate dates. Roughly those what, 300, 350 years-ish, the Roman Empire, the Roman world, experiences drastic changes. Those changes are many and varied. The rise of um, Christianity as a new religion, the redefinition of marriages, which we'll talk about later in this video, uh, changes to the imperial cult, which we'll talk about in a separate video, barbarian migrations, barbarian invasions, uh, changes to the military, changes to the political and economic structures of the Roman Empire, etc. But central to all of this, presiding over all of it, were the transformations of the late Roman aristocracy. So, like I said before, in this video what we're doing is broadly examining the late Roman aristocracy and what those changes meant to them. Okay, so this map on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, this is approximately, I don't know if it's entirely exact, but it's approximately um, every Roman city and settlement in the empire. So, as you can see from the map, actually it roughly correlates to the actual boundaries of the Roman Empire. Obviously, we have a lot of clusters um, around the Mediterranean, this idea of, you know, classical civilization... Italy, Greece, chunks of Anatolia, uh, what is state Egypt, and Israel, and North Africa, the Mediterranean coast of Spain, and then we go further north into, you know, Gaul, Britain. So, those dots, those are the hearts of Roman civilization. Those are the cities, those are the towns. Within the city, it is because they have cities and walled towns, that kind of thing, that Romans believed they were up here in terms of the social order. The word for civilization comes from the Roman term for city. So, if you don't have cities, you don't have walled towns or anything like that, well, you're not civilized. Well, what are you then? You're a barbarian. So, then, the life of the Roman aristocracy, specifically the late Roman aristocracy, revolved around city life. It, re it revolved around urban communities. Yeah, you might have a, a country estate, something we might consider to be like a manor or a country mansion. You might have a large house with a lot of land. Maybe you have some hedgerows around it. Maybe you have some peasants that come till your fields. And you might spend time there. But really, 
if you want to be a good late Roman aristocrat, you can't spend too much time from the cities. And one of the sources we have from late antiquity is this book of jokes. And one of the jokes that source makes is, well, if you're going from the city, this urban center, this urban environment, to your country estate or to another village or something, you're on the road, what do you pass? We pass signposts, right? Rome is in that direction, Byzantium's that way, Londinium is, you know, go across the channel, it's over there, that kind of thing. And oftentimes, these signposts and mile markers would tell you how far from each place you were at that moment. One of the jokes is that Roman aristocrats would retool, repaint the signs to change the distances, to show that their country estates really weren't as far from the cities as they really were. So even though you leave the city, you're still close to it. Now we have at least 100 cities, probably more, um, founded by the Romans over the course of their empire, and many others integrated work into the Roman system. These include towns, um, which eventually grow up in the cities, and other stuff was absorbed via conquest. But again, my point is that you know, this map shows the hearts of the Roman Empire, and I'm using hearts, plural, because it's not just one city. Yeah, Rome's the eternal one, but all the Roman aristocrats, these red dots, this is where they lived and this is where they thrived. You have to understand the centrality that the city played in the worldview and the mindset of the late Roman aristocrats to understand how and why they operated the way they did. So with that being said, uh, this little diagram I've got in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, this, you know, Blue oval says aristocrats, and the red one that says the Roman general population. This is, to the Roman mindset, how the aristocrats viewed their world. It's not a pyramid, in the sense that maybe you can move up and down. To Roman aristocrats, especially the wealthier Roman aristocrats, this is it. They're distinct from everybody else. They are, in the words of Peter Brown, the well-born few, in the words of Peter Heather, uh, they are the better part of humankind. And it's within cities, within these urban centers, that aristocrats view this social construct, this social situation. It's the aristocrats and then it's the general population, everybody else. So some historians, some archaeologists, and a lot of lay people speculate about whether or not, you know, should we look at the general population and view it as, well, maybe there's a middle class or something approximating what we would understand to be a middle class, and then poor people, and maybe there's some, um, you know, shades of gray in between? That maybe is not incorrect to talk about, to speculate about. But the point for this video is that the aristocrats don't see that. It's not shades of gray, it's black and white. The aristocrats and everybody else. And the aristocrats set themselves apart from this mass from this unwashed horde of the general people, uh, via distinguished cultural and social lives. So, what marks them out? To the late Roman aristocrats, what marks them out from everybody else, what puts them in this special little bubble, is their education, which we'll talk about more in a minute, uh, their poise, how they carry themselves, their diction, how they speak, right, their philosophy and other outlooks on life, and otium. Otium is this, uh, and I've talked about it before a few times, Otium is this idea of uh, cultured leisure. You're so well educated and so wealthy that you don't devote your life to manual labor. You devote it to scholarship or other cultural pursuits. That's what you should be doing with your time. And the key point is that, and I'm hoping the diagram gets this across to you, that divide can't be crossed. This thing can't be shared. Yeah, in actuality, there were maybe some lower ranks of aristocrats that moved up and down. Again, this goes back to this whole idea of, should we view this as maybe some kind of a middle class existing in Roman society? Maybe, but for the upper level aristocrats, this divide, this is how they understood the world. That's what matters. Now, central to that is the idea of the uh, paterfamilias. It's this idea that the Roman father is the head of the household. He controls everything, and in some ways he has um, near absolute power over everybody until they leave his household, especially his daughters. The daughter comes under the domination of her husband, especially in classical uh, Republican and early imperial times. So that's best illustrated, best demonstrated, I think, by this idea that, you know, the Roman father doesn't have a child. What I mean by that is, you know, mommy and daddy doing a fun time at night, and then nine months later, oh, here comes the baby. 
Mom pushes it out. No, 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 no. What happens, more often than not, okay, is mom pushes out the child, and that baby is placed on the ground. And the father decides whether or not he wants that child in his household by picking it up. He literally takes the child off the ground and brings it into his family. So again, this whole theme of life and death. And central to that child's life, if they survive and if they're male, a little bit if they're female, but especially if they're male, is uh, the city life and the role that the city plays in educational matters. So what that looks like is this. When they reach about seven years old, uh, the pedagogus, the slave teacher, more often than not they were Greek, but not necessarily. The pedagogus, from where we get the term uh, pedagogy, takes the seven-year-old child and leads him by the hand through the city. So he's seeing the urban sites, he's smelling all the crap in the street, and he's hearing the sound, he's seeing everybody. He's understanding that the city is where he belongs. And then he's led into the forum, into the center of the city, the key meeting ground of the urban center. And in classrooms which are not fully closed off um, by sheets or maybe low-hanging walls, in the forum, the child sits and he has his education. So this results eventually in what become known as the official skills of human relations. So what does that look like? This basically is it. Roman education was a literary one. So through literary education, what we would understand to be like, you know, the, the classics, um, it's believed or was believed by the Romans that you get three things. You get moral grooming. You understand right from wrong. You understand how to tell the difference. You get control of your emotions. And we'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, and then you get the correct use of language, the correct use of diction. You do not swear. You do not use any kind of profanity. You express yourself clearly and articulately because if you don't, well then, you're not showing the mark of being an educated person. And you're showing yourself to be no better, perhaps, than a dirty, filthy vagrant on the street. Same thing if you lose control of your emotions. You cave into human nature. You're not supposed to do that because your education takes you from here and moves you up. Now, with that said, Peter Brown brings up this additional point, and what he states is the following on page 5 of this article, The Wellborn Few. What could almost be called moral hypochondria formed a firm barrier between the elite and their inferiors. Again, we have this idea that, you know, there's a dividing line, it can't be crossed... The harmonious person, groomed by long education and shaped by constant pressure of his peers, was thought to live at risk. He was exposed to the ever-present threat of moral contagion from anomalous emotions and actions inappropriate to his own public status, though acceptable in the uncultivated society of his inferiors. I use hypochondria advisedly, for this was the age of the great doctors, most notably the Dr. Galen, whose work circulated among the well-born. So, Roman culture, and if you do a PhD in Roman history, um, there's a very good reason why one of your reading fields will be in Greek history. Roman culture inherits a lot from the Greeks. And late Roman aristocrats, drawing on Greek traditions, Greek ideas, firmly believed that... Your physical self, your body, it reflects your inner uh, moral character. So, therefore, how you carry yourself, what you look like, how you behave, is the physical anchor, the physiological anchor of your own inner moral code. So, to late Roman aristocrats, if you have a corrupt body, if you are, I don't know, fat, maybe you have a beer belly, um, or you're unwashed, you're filthy, that betrays a corrupt lewd mind. So this is the age of fluids. This is what eventually becomes known in the medieval period as this idea of um, humors, this idea that the immune system and everything else is governed by a balance of bile, black bile, other fluids in your body. Um, and if you have too much of one, it upsets your inner condition and it results in illness, it results in, um, you know, in this particular instance, moral contagion, etc. So if you lose too much of your fluid through, shall we say, bedroom excess, you see where I'm going with this, um, 
your body becomes weak. And if it's weak, because your physical form is not as strong as it should be, your morality becomes weakened. So, to put it another way, you know, to keep going with that analogy, if you sleep around too much, you lose too much of your male juice, so we say, um, your body becomes weakened, so your morals are weakened, and you become morally corrupt, and then the body becomes corrupted and weak. How you look for the late Roman aristocracy dictates your inner self, and then the reverse is also true. So, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit more about um, sexuality and emotions among the late Roman aristocracy, and they have this neat little, you know, chunk of four circles here, which kind of sum up the key points. So, we talked a few minutes ago about literary education, one of the things it teaches you to do is control your emotions. Why would you want to do that? And the answer is that it's not out of any uh, moral code, any kind of moral idea that violence or, or killing is necessarily bad. If you beat a slave to death with a curtain rod, that's not necessarily a problem. It's not bad because it's evil, because you committed murder. It's bad because if you get pissed off and you rip down the curtain rod, or you, fight, or you pick up your fire poker or something else, and you beat your slave to death, or you beat them senseless, um, you gave in to your emotions. You lost control of yourself. And that means that you're no longer um, an aristocrat. Your inner self, your Inner morality is no longer correct. You give in to your emotions and now you're just no better than a guy on the street. Now, going off of that, the late Roman aristocracy, they don't distinguish between homosexual and uh, heterosexual relations or homosexual or heterosexual love. That doesn't really matter to them. What matters is that you can't be on the bottom taking it. If you do, you're not masculine. If you're not giving it, you're womanly. That's a woman's job. If you're a late aristocratic male, you can't do that. So then, uh, sexual relations, intimacy, becomes a possible moral contagion for the aristocracy. If you like getting it too much, your inner self is weakened. Again, we go back to this whole idea of they're constantly under threat of being corrupted. Those ideas, those concepts, however, they only apply to the um, well-born few, to the aristocrats. It becomes then, because they are above everybody else, the job of the aristocrat in the late Roman Empire, well, they have a couple jobs, but for this one, for this video, what I want to talk about is their social task. The social task, the social objective of the late Roman aristocracy is to look after everybody else. You know, oh, you poor people, you don't really know what you're doing. Let me educate you, let me lift you up. So therefore, aristocrats use their vast wealth uh, for social programs. They fund gladiatorial games, they fund brothels, they fund public works for the benefit of the low-born masses, and they also fund places like baths, like this. These are the ruins of the baths of uh, Caracalla. Now here, we have an issue, because in Roman baths, and this gets back to the idea of um, correct poise, how you carry yourself. Romans walked around nude here. They were naked. In the modern day now, we have this idea that nudity often is correlated uh, with shame. For the Romans, that doesn't matter. If you go to the bath, you're usually walking around without clothes. What matters is how you look. A late Roman aristocrat can't be too jacked, otherwise they do you know, manual labor for a living. You can't be too slim, that means no food, so you're not healthy. Um, you have to be... This nice middle ground, this ideal, you know, sexual beast. And you have to carry yourself correctly. Because, again, that shows your inner moral correctness, which reflects, in, which reflects on your physical person. So, once again, we have this map of all the late Roman towns and cities. And I'm bringing this up because these places have to be defended somehow. Um, and the Romans used their military and their road system to do so. So, in the late Roman Empire... It's a state that's characterized, you know, especially in popular memory and survey textbooks, as a state under constant armed threat by outsiders, the so-called barbarians. So, if the aristocrats then, if they're going to remain prominent in their cities as we move into the late Roman Empire, because military and military discipline pervade everything, that means for them they have to have a revolution at home in moral discipline to enable them to mobilize their following and create moral discipline in the cities. And that begins with marriages. So what we see in late antiquity is what Peter Brown called a marriage revolution. 
So, uh, the Antonine period, which I've mentioned a little bit in this video, roughly 96 to 192. Prior to that era, prior to this reign of, you know, the five good emperors, Nerva, Trajan, and everybody else, um, Roman women, they have freedom, they have what we would maybe consider to be emancipation, but it's emancipation via contempt and neglect. Rome is a man's world, and women can do what they like, because for the aristocrats, they didn't really think it mattered. For the aristocrats, what women did didn't matter. They were insignificant. Um, but in the Antonine period and moving forward, women become the front and center of aristocratic life because the woman was considered to be untamed, maybe partially wild. So to discipline the woman, to discipline your wife via philosophy, via Roman culture, means to conquer the other in the marriage, and thus tame the marriage, bring the marriage into order. Therefore, public order in the late Roman Empire begins at home. Stable aristocratic households result in a stable city, which results in a stable province, which results in a stable empire. That's not always how it worked in practice, but that was the idea. Doing this, this is where um, late Roman philosophy comes into play. So the philosophers in the Roman Empire, they claim to be universalist, they claim to speak for everybody, mankind as a whole. Not really though, um, this is more of a countercultural thing among the late Roman aristocrats. And because it's a countercultural thing among the late Roman aristocrats, they only deal with a chunk, with a portion of their peers, with a portion of the late Roman aristocracy. But philosophy, that's required to help reshape the marriage and the changing role the aristocrat is going to be playing in the late Roman Empire. So the philosophy they harp on, the one they like, is Stoicism. Why do they like Stoicism? Well, Stoicism, um, it leads aristocrats to believe and to do two things. One, they consider themselves to be universalists, men of the world. Yeah, they're part of their city, that's where they live, that's where they interact, but really, they're the better part of humankind. These are the guys where if there's a problem, they're going to step in and do the rescuing. Stoicism leads them to believe that. And the other thing it leads them to believe and to do is to control your inner demons, control your inner lust, your inner desires. So, in marriage, you can't go after your maid servant. Your appetites are only for your wife, only in the confines of your bedroom. So therefore, marriages, you know, at least in theory, they change and become a strong uh, social pillar. Again, this whole idea of setting everything right, this goes back to the late Roman idea that through education, your moral compass, your inside person, is set to be correct, and that exhibits itself in daily life. Stoicism in the late Roman Empire is all about discipline, mastering yourself. Well, when Christianity comes into play, and we get monasticism, monasticism is all about discipline, mastering yourself to be a better servant to God. So Stoicism and late antique aristocratic culture is a major reason why the late Roman aristocracy begins converting to Christianity and gradually from there the late Roman Empire. So that's been my brief spiel, my brief um, work through of this article written by Peter Brown. So guys, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Hope you enjoyed, take care, and I will see you all next time.